Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope you're doing well. It's still National Poetry Month here in the US, so I'm dipping in and out of anthologies uh, and really enjoying that. But I did want to make a video talking about one of my favorite poets from the second half of the 20th century here in the US, uh, and that's Mae Swenson. I find her, uh, the way she fuses so many fascinating poetic sensibilities together is something I really enjoy. Every time I read her poems, I find some new aspect to appreciate and sort of uh, reflect on. Uh, and so, she, she has a deep appreciation for nature, and it's much more than just this like pastoral whimsy. <laughs> I talked a little bit about that when I was discussing Virgil's Eclogues earlier this month. Uh, you know, Swenson has this really deep appreciation for nature as someone who, who has spent time in it, spent time outside, <laughs> spent time in, a, in not, not just in the beauty, but in like a cold winter. Uh, but she also approaches it from the perspective of somebody who understands science in the 20th century. Uh, in some of her poems, there's references to DNA or uh, really thoughtful reflections on astronomy. So that's really, uh, you know, and she accomplishes it. She pulls it off really well. Uh, another side is just her, the deep passion that she reveals. And in her early, uh, in her early works, usually those are uncollected poems. They're written contemporaneously to her early collections, but then they remain unpublished. Uh, thankfully, the Library of America collection collects those, and you can sort of read the collected poems and then go and <laughs> check the years and read the uncollected poems. Um, and so that side uh, continues to sort of blossom um, as her career progresses. And then the third aspect is the one that she's probably most famous for, and some people kind of consider a parlor trick, is, uh, and that is the way she begins to view poems not just as language and imagery from language, but as visual like pieces of art on a piece of paper. And so the way the words are aligned or spaced or even tilted, that creates different visual effects and shapes. So it's not just reading it and picturing the imagery in our minds, but actually reading it and, and appreciating the, the physical you know, uh, image of the poem itself. So all three of those are present in her 1958 collection, A Cage of Spines, which was her second published collection. And I want to just kind of give one example of each. Uh, so we'll kick off with Fountain Piece 1, which has that visual aspect where the, the lines are sort of jagged and they create this effect that I think becomes very clear from the first couple lines. A bird is perched upon a wing. The wing is stone, the bird is real. And those lines form sort of the quick V shape that a bird's wings might form. Uh, and also that language, it starts out almost like a 1950s children's book, Sea Spot, Sea Spot Run. So a bird is perched upon a wing. The wing is stone, the bird is real. A drapery falls about this form. The form is stone, the dress is rain. The pigeon preens his own and does not know. He sits upon a wing. The angel does not feel, a relative among her large, feathers stretch and take his span, in charge and leave her there, with her cold wings that cannot fold, while his fan in air. The fountain raining wets the stone, but does not know it dresses, an angel in its tresses. Her stone cheek smiles and does not care, that real tears flow there. Uh, and so again, Sure, there's this visual image when we can think of Mae Swenson as a poet who, you know, understood geometry on a two-dimensional piece of paper. But her, her skill as a poet uh, and the language and imagery she employs is just absolutely wonderful. And that's evident in two-part parable, or two-part parable, uh, where we get, you know, an, another real focus on nature now. In a country where every tree is a pear tree, it is a shock to see one tree, a pear tree undoubtedly, for its leaves are the leaves of a pear that shows no pears. It is a fairly tall tree, sturdy, capable looking, its limbs strong, its leaves glossy, its posture in fact exceptionally pleasing. But there, among the true pear trees, all of which show pears, the pear tree with no pear pears appears to say the least unlikely and therefore unlovely. You see those globes invariably grow in the trees of that country. There are no other kinds of trees and pears in the pear trees are what make them trees. As much, no even more than their leaves. Otherwise they would be named leaf trees. Pears are what the trees have. The leaves are accessory. 
They are there to set off the shapes and colors of the fruits and shade them naturally and shelter them. It is as if the trees were great cool nests for the pears, so that a nest, like the rest, apparently, but empty, is inconceivable, like seeing a ghost, or at most a body without bones. It is a shock and a pity to see a pear tree that can't be, but is. Uh, <laughs> I, that's a fantastic poem. <laughs> the way the the use of pear repeatedly uh, through it, you know, gives it this almost chant. Um, but the the way the lines are broken up creates, you know, longer thoughts and then quick replies. It's almost as if you know Swenson is having a dialogue uh, with herself throughout the poem as she observes the pear tree that can't bear fruit, even though it is, as we say, it's fairly tall, sturdy, capable looking. Uh, it has the leaves, the empty nest, and I think personally, I think this poem is uh, is a poem where Swenson is sort of considering this, this idea of being a woman in 1958 or somewhere between 1954 and 58 who is probably recognizing she may never become a mother. Um, she has realized at this point uh, that she is a lesbian. Her parents, you know, don't totally accept that. Uh, she's coming from a very traditional um, uh, family. And so she is realizing this. Uh, she has, you know, kind of moved and is no longer just living uh, in in Utah where she had spent uh, so much of her life or even at Utah State University. She spent time in uh, other cities and she's starting to realize that sort of the expectation for what she was held up as, as an ideal for her future is not at all going to be what her future actually holds. Uh, and I think that's what's going on in here. And she's asking, you know, is, is she therefore unlovely? Um, and sort of trying to reconcile that with herself. Um, and, but it, it's an astonishing poem. Uh, but the last I, I said I had mentioned is that in some of her early uh, works we don't have the really um, passionate central poems uh, again I think just because she wasn't entirely uh, ready yet to, to include those in her publications her later po poetry collections will include more of the types of poetry that would be uncollected um, and so this is facing and even here there's sort of this idea of there's a one, two, so there's almost this dialogue between the two, and we're gonna read down and then read over here. Uh, and but, but they're staged so that you could almost read across, and it would be a very different effect. You I love, you that are light, by which I am discovered, in anonymous night. By your eye am I born, and I know that by your body I glow, and by your face I make my circle. It is your heat fires me, that my skin is sweet, my veins race, my bones are radiant. You are that central one by which I am balanced. By your power it is done. That in the sky of being my path is thrown, and I glide in your sling and cannot fall into darkness. For by the magnet of your body, charged with love, do I move. Uh, and so yeah, there's these, this you know, idea that maybe she's talking about the sun, or, uh, and, you know, and it's the sl it moves as a sling across the sky. Uh, but the first line of the second part suggests that as you are sun to me, oh, I am moon to you and give you substance by my sight and motion and radiance. You are an ocean shaped by my gaze. My pulsing rays draw you naked from the spell of night. By my pull are you waked to know that you are beautiful. I rake up your steep luster and your passion. By my sorcery, your wealth is sown. To you on your own breast, your purples changed to opals. So with love's light, I sculpture you and in my constant mirror keep your portrait that you may adore yourself as I do. And I, I love that poem because it feels like such a strong response to the question about the pear tree being lovely uh, in two part parable. Um, and so I, I just kind of like to juxtapose those as a reader. But anyhow, this was Mae Swenson, again, one of my favorite poets, someone uh, up there, I, I would say, she, depending on my mood, I place her either just above or right next to um, Elizabeth Bishop as my two favorites. And then John Berryman is probably my third uh, favorite poet in English in, you know, post-1950 in the U.S. In terms of other poets I was thinking of, I had mentioned some of the romantic poets, um, and I think she kind of steals the best aspects from Wordsworth and Shelley, uh, and then just you know combines them together. But someone I, I was thinking of was uh, the Roman poet Tibullus, who doesn't—he only has like 
two collections of uh, elegies, but a very strong uh, sensibility. Um, and he's again someone who kind of draws little different pieces and then wraps it all up in, in a way that just feels like he's viewing reality from a different perspective from so many other people. Uh, and in a way that makes us want to capture that view as well. Um, Swenson, of course, is writing uh, a little bit after the early beats, but right kind of in the same period as many of the San Francisco beats or as the second wave of New York beats ar arise. I find I prefer her poetry to the beat writers. Um, and then kind of as a weird one, dipping in and out of Duck's New Report by Lucy Ellman, there are aspects I find that Elman captures as well. I think this is a book that can be read. There are sections from it that can be read almost as lines, you know, of poetry. The the, the fact that refrain that is uh, in the book frequently, and some of the the concerns, the images, the fusion of nature, and then this idea of getting on a subway, which is in uh, a cage of spines, is very much present in um, you know the the massive. <laughs> ocean of consciousness that is Duck's new report. So this was Mae Swenson, A Cage of Spines. Let me know if you've read any of her poetry. Uh, and again, yeah, hope everybody's doing well.